the story of Diamond Jim Brady. One of the dashing characters who lived in this and the last century was named James Buchanan Brady after the Democratic nominee for the presidential election in 1856. Brady left school at an early age and secured a job as bellhop in a New York hotel. From there to the baggage department of the New York Central Railroad and by attending night school, improved himself until by the time he was 21 he was chief clerk to John M. Tusi, an official of the road through whom he obtained a position for his elder brother Dan. One day, Tusi summoned Jim Brady to his office. Jim, I sent for you to give you a chance to vindicate yourself. I've tried to be a friend to you, but you're the best friend I ever had, Mr. Tusi. I'm glad you feel that way. Now, Jim, can you explain this report I have before me? What is it? We've caught your brother in some business irregularities, but he's implicated you. What? In fact, he places most of the blame on you. You mean Dan accuses me of dishonesty? That's right. Well, then there's nothing to say. You, you, you refuse to defend yourself? I have nothing to say, Mr. Tucci. Is this final? Yes, sir. Well, Jim, much as I dislike it, I'm forced to ask for your resignation. A resignation? That's it. I can't bring myself to believe you're guilty. Business etiquette demands that you be dropped from the rolls of the New York Central. But that doesn't mean I can't recommend you to another employer. Thank you, Mr. Tucci. Someday I'll try to repay you and the New York Central. Tusi, true to his word, recommended Jim to the railroad supply house of Manning, Maxwell, and Moore. He started with the firm as a salesman, and it was shortly after this that his interest in diamonds led to the nickname Diamond Jim, which stuck to him through the rest of his life. As a salesman, he headed the company's list, and when an Englishman, Samson Fox, invaded the United States with a new railroad under truck and approached the firm of Manning, Maxwell, and Moore, Brady, the super salesman, was summoned to the interview. Brady, this is Mr. Fox, president of the Leeds Forge Company of Leeds, England. Glad to know you. Pleasure, I'm sure. Mr. Moore tells me you're the best railway supply salesman in this country. <laughs> I think Mr. Moore overestimates my ability a little. I'm going to leave you two for a moment. I've already explained the merits of your under truck. Mr. Fox, if you can make a deal with Jim, he can sell every railroad in this country. Now, Mr. Brady, I'll be as brief as possible. The Fox under truck is made of pressed steel. Saves weight, is light, strong, and will carry double the load that your wooden beams will take. Well, why were the railroad officials opposed to it? They say it won't take curves, but I assure you no curve is too severe for the Fox under truck. Mm -hmm. Sounds good to me. I'm interested. What's your proposition, Mr. Fox? I'm willing to make you sole representative in this country and pay you 33 and one third percent on every sale you make. That's great. I'll take your offer. Pardon me, Jeff. Oh, hello, Brady. Oh, come right in, Mr. Buchanan. Uh, Mr. Moore will be back in a minute. Oh, uh, do you know Mr. Fox or Mr. Buchanan of the New York Central? Fox? Oh, yes. You make that steel under truck, don't you? Yes, that's right. And now you're trying to sell Brady. I'm not trying. <laughs> He's sold me. And now I'm going to sell you. Not in a million years. No? Mr. Buchanan, the New York Central can use this under truck. Now, you are the superintendent of motive power and have the authority to make a test installation. Brady, that fox under truck is not practical. How are you going to take our bad curves with steel? Much better than you do with a wooden beam. My boy, those trucks are much too rigid for our roads. They couldn't stand the punishment on the curves. They lack flexibility. I think I know a little bit about freight cars, and I say they will work. Now, I'll tell you what you do. Run a test load on them. And if they don't do all that we claim, I'll pay the cost of the test myself. Can you afford to pay what it will cost if they fail? Well, not personally, but Mr. Fox can and will. Will I? He'll I... be glad to. Fine. Then we'll try it out at once. Well, do you have that much faith in them, Jim? I guess I can take a chance. Have you enough trucks to make up a train load? Ten cars? Twice that size. How long to install them? Three days. Give us some good workmen and a good shop. All right. You're on. We're going to run this train to Albany and back. Now, Brady, you, Fox, and myself are going to take the trip. Get aboard. Fine. How heavy are the cars loaded? Twice their capacity. That was your suggestion. 
But I don't think they can hold us. These are real trucks, Mr. Buchanan. Don't forget, Jim, if anything goes wrong, you're paying for it. And don't you forget that you're going to go through with this, and you're going to order. Now, I know my goods, and unless I know them, I don't try to sell them. I hope you're right. How much are they going to cost a piece? How much do they cost us to make, Fox? About $15 a piece. One hundred and twenty-five dollars a piece, Mr. Buchanan. But Mr. Mr. Buchanan gets our lowest price. More speed. Look at this curve. The load we're carrying? Let it slow down. Still on the swing? Why, this will double your freight receipt. Same size train as before. Believe me, this is the greatest improvement in railroading that we'll see as long as we live. Thunder Truck was a tremendous success in the start of the Brady fortune. Diamond Jim was known for his love of good food and his ability to consume great quantities at each meal. He never liked to eat alone, and his favorite spot was Rector's. Good evening, George. Good evening, Mr. Brady. Well, nice crowd tonight. Yes, indeed, Mr. Brady. Here's your orange juice, sir. Ah, yes. George, there's nothing like a gallon of fresh orange juice to start a meal with. <laughs> now, let me see. Three dozen extra-large Linhaven oysters to start. Hello, Mr. Brady. Hello, Pete. How's things? Not so good, Mr. Brady. A little short. Well, better come around and see me. Thanks, Jim. Lobster American, and then I'll have a dozen hard-shell crab. Yes, Mr. Brady. Oh, Mr. Brady, I'm so glad to find you. Well, hello there, Dorothy. Why? What's wrong? Well, you see, the show closed, and and I wondered if if you'd let me have enough money to get home to Why, my house. Sure, sure. How much? Well, the fare is twenty-seven dollars. All right. Here you are. Well, but Mister Brady, this is a hundred-dollar bill. Better take it. Maybe you'll need it. Oh, thank you so much, Mister Brady. That's yeah, all right. Uh, write me when you get home. Oh yes, I will. Goodbye. Goodbye. Nice girl, George. Have you known her long, sir? Yes. Known her since she was a kid. Daughter of an old friend of mine. Gee, Jim, I'm glad I found you. Well, uh, what's happened, Bob? My wife's got to go to the hospital. Operation. I haven't got a stamp. I want to... Sure, sure. Here, take a thousand. If that ain't enough, come back and get some more. Thanks, Jim. I won't forget this. I'm serious, to... too, you know. Mr. Brady, very embarrassing to have things like this happening in Rector. Oh, sure. Don't let it bother you, George. Pardon my saying it, sir. But I think some of these people are taking advantage of you. <laughs> George, I know some of them are pulling my leg, but, you know, it, it's kind of fun to be a sucker. Well, when you can afford it. In the gay 90s, the whole world got on wheels. Everyone who had the price bought a bicycle. Jim owned two dozen. He loaned them to his friends, and he had one made to order for his dearest friend, the actress Lillian Russell. Open that leather case, Lillian. What in heaven's name can you have in this huge case? A little piece of jewelry for you. Oh, I see now. A bicycle. All gold. Oh, Jim, that's the most beautiful... Mother of pearl handlebars. And Jim... Those stones set on the frame and around the wheels, are they... Yeah. Real diamonds. Well, you wouldn't want cheap imitations set in gold, would you? No, Jim, you're right. <laughs> I'm going to give you a big kiss and a hug. There. Thanks, Lillian. <laughs> that was no imitation either. <laughs> <laughs> In 
1912, Jim was taken very ill and rushed to the Johns Hopkins Hospital, Baltimore, on a special train where Dr. Young operated and saved his life. How are you feeling, Mr. Brady? Never better, Doc. Feel well enough to leave? Well, I should say so. You know, Doc, this business of saving lives is kind of interesting, ain't it, Doc? Yeah, it certainly is. And one that leaves much to be discovered. Well, I... I suppose it takes a lot of money to do all this experimenting. Yes. Yeah. More, unfortunately, than we here at Johns Hopkins are able to obtain. You know, Doc, I'd like to help you along down here. Oh, please don't feel that you're under obligations to us for what we've done for you. Dr. Young, my income is over a million dollars a year. Now, uh, just what could you do if I was to give you, say, a couple of hundred thousand? Mr. Brady, with $200,000, I could build and equip the finest clinic in the world. Well, what do you say we do it? Well, I, I can't find words to explain Well, don't myself. bother, Dr. Young. It's all settled. We start to build it once. Years later, August of 1915, the doors of the James Buchanan Brady Institute were opened. In the meantime, Diamond Jim augmented his original gift with an extra $15,000 a year. This institute and its work stands as a monument to James Buchanan Brady, better known as Diamond Jim, who started life as a poor boy and amassed a huge fortune through his own efforts. We can truly call such a man Captain of Industry. <laughs> <laughs>